Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're really excited to be here today. Today, we're going to talk to you about baby <coughs> products, what to buy for your baby. My name is Dr. Kimberly Lank. I work for Hogue, or we both work for Hogue Medical <laughs> Group. I work in Huntington Beach, and this is my colleague. I'm Dr. Julie Palmasano, um, and I work at uh, in one of our Irvine offices. So let's get started. Um, so we're so. Our goal here today is to hopefully make some sense of some of the baby products out there because um, there's a lot, right? Uh, and marketing companies make infinitely more products than you actually need. So we're hoping to kind of talk about types of products. Um, there will be, we're using lots of pictures in here. Um, and I just want to be clear that when we use the pictures, it's not because we're specifically um, highlighting that brand. It's just that brand happened to have a nice photo for us to use. Um, and so we're going to, to point out the particular, particularly useful items and also like what features um, are useful for each one. So what I would also say is that with this Zoom platform, we're also limited in time and the baby products list go on forever. So the ones that we're going to focus on today are going to be sleep and feeding, which is mainly all your baby does the first month. So those seems like the most important places to start. Okay, so if we're going to start about, uh, talking about sleeping, before I even go into products, I have to definitely talk about safety because um, that's really, really important. As pediatricians, we could not talk about um, baby products, with, um, sleep <coughs> products in, in general without talking about the uh, safety aspects. So um, for safe sleep, you want to prevent um, or decrease the risk of SIDS. And in order to do that, the things that you want for your baby when they're sleeping, you want a firm mattress, fitted sheet, um, crib, bassinet, play yard. Um, we'll be talking about that with another next couple of slides. You want nothing else in their bed with them, no blankets, no crib bumpers, no positioners, like incline, pillows, stuffed animals, nothing. Basically nothing extra. You want it to be as boring as possible. And of course, you don't want any other people in there. You don't want to do any co-sleeping with your baby. So this is how you keep your baby safe. Okay, so generally in the beginning, you start off with a bassinet um, because you the safest way to have your baby sleep in the beginning for the first um, six months is in your room with you <coughs> and next to your bed because you're going to be feeding them quite frequently throughout the night. Um, so these uh, bassinets, as you can see, are compact. Um, they are uh, convenient, and you can actually bring them around the house, but typically you won't. You'll just leave them in your room. Um, and you don't use them past four months generally because they do grow out of these. So so one thing that we want to stress is to not overthink this. Um, there are a lot of bells and whistles that can come with these um, bassinets. They, you can spend $1,000 on a bassinet, but it's usually not needed, especially because they grow out of them so quickly. So the um, general theme of this conversation is actually going to be start the basics and work your way up if needed. Okay, and then these are some extra items that are marketed out there for sleeping. Um, they're kind of nice because you can go around the house with them. They're obviously very lightweight, so they're infant loungers, sleepers. Um, they're portable. Um, they're for, again, younger infants, but it's important to note that these are not safe sleeping spaces. So your baby can sleep in there, but you cannot because you have to watch them because it's not safe. Um, the loungers are <coughs> nice and cushiony. You see there's it's soft, it's plush. There's a little bumper on the edge. The babies like it because they feel secure, but it's not safe. So, um, And then the sleepers, you can put them in your bed with with you, like next to you in there, but that will make it a, a flat surface. They might roll. So again, you need to be up and awake. And then again, all these like bells and whistles. So these are um, bassinets that are talked about a lot right now. Um, these electronic smart bassinets that rock your baby and they do all these other extra things like white noise. Um, they're pretty expensive. Um, again, not used to usually past four months. So pretty fast that your baby will be out of this device. Um, and it's important to note that they haven't actually been deemed to be safe for sleeping yet. So the jury's out on whether or not these are actually um, helpful to prevent SIDS. So it's definitely a gray zone. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't start here. Um, it's not something that, like again, you have to spend all that money on. And we don't know quite yet if they're, if they're actually safe for sleeping. OK, and then also, they are marketed, though, as the safest place for your baby to sleep a lot of the time, so just be aware of that. Okay, and then cribs. So before I talk about cribs, I'm going to talk about play yards because um, 
before your baby makes it into a crib, usually the crib is in the nursery or a different room because you usually don't have space in your room next to you to have a crib. So um, then there's like that area where you're like, okay, now my baby's out of the bassinet, but they're not ready for the crib yet because again, you want your baby to be in your room with you until six months for safe sleeping. Um, so then you move them into a, what I usually recommend is a play yard because they're portable, they're cheap. Um, you can bring them around with you, you can travel with them, you can have them at your um, in-laws, your parents, your uh, you know aunts and uncles, um, bring them with you when you're traveling. I usually don't recommend all the extra stuff on top. So the one that we posted here is more of like, you don't need all this extra stuff. Um, buy the one that has nothing else um, added onto it because they're a lot more expensive and you don't need it. Um, it's just that bottom area there. That's the safe sleeping area. Um, and you can, you know, as you said that um, it being helpful at other people's houses. So a lot of a lot of families are lucky enough that grandma or grandpa or or like you said aunts or uncles are are spend a lot of time taking care of the children mm -hmm. and so this is great for their house right yep. like you were saying because um the baby can sleep safely you, the baby can be there for quite a while in terms of age and this just folds up and they can put it away when the baby's gone yep. too yep. so this works very nice. Yeah, I love it. You put it in your car with you. Yeah, it's great. Or all around the house. You can also use it just for a play area too. I know that um, when I had one of my sons, we were in an apartment that had two floors. So on the second floor was where the bedrooms were and that's where the crib was. And then on the first floor, I actually had a play yard so that even if I was cooking or, you know, had to maybe use the restroom once. Um, then you can put your baby in that and I wouldn't have to go up and down the stairs, especially because I had C-sections. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. accessibility was very important yep. Yep. for recuperation. It's such a safe, just also just having a safe place knowing that you don't have to just worry if you have to just go to the bathroom, do something fast. Um, but yeah, they're very convenient. I actually have two in my house <laughs> because I like to bring one. And so often one was in my car a lot, just like sitting there waiting to go wherever I went. So I didn't have to worry. Um, so great for the in-between phase and also just portability. And my son actually didn't um, graduate, graduate out of his until like maybe like a few months ago. And he's almost, he's almost two and a half. <laughs> but um, basically you can keep him in there around yeah, 15 months, 18 months or so, um, they can cl climb out of it after that, but um, they can be in there for quite a while. Um, and then for cribs, so um, again, less is more with most of these cribs. Um, this is actually the one that I got for my kids. Um, they're really great that you can um, transition them these days and they don't cost that much more to buy a transitional crib. Um, so again, once they are able to um, climb out of the crib is when you need to start transitioning them to a toddler bed. So you see these different phases that they can, um, that you can transition into. And um, note that there are pillows, but past the age that they are 12 months and transitioning to a toddler bed. So you can't have the pillows in there earlier on. Um, so so again, make sure if they're climbing out of it, maybe it's hard to say exactly when that's gonna happen, but once it does, transition out. And the other thing that I would point out is that you don't have to have a bassinet or the, you know, the, the other lounger. Um, I know that, for example, when I had my first son, we were living in a place that our bedroom was so narrow that you could not you could not put one of those in the bedroom um, and we actually had in the nursery we had a single bed in there um, and so we so my son slept in the crib and I slept in the single bed at first and then we were living somewhere different when I had my second son because we moved around a lot and for my second son um, we didn't have a nursery. So my two-year-old was in his room and then we had a bedroom that was big enough for the crib. And so the crib was actually in the room with me. And I just put it all the way up to the highest mm -hmm. um, rung. So we, you know, I didn't use a bassinet. A bassinet. Yeah, and, and that's, tip, that, that's <coughs> common too. Right. If you have the space, then absolutely. Okay. And then for swaddling, um, most babies do like to be swaddled. It's nice for soothing. So, um, so swaddling, it's hard though, because in the middle of the night when you're really tired, using a blanket for this can be challenging and you might worry because of what if it loosens up and they get out of it. So um, this is like a fun pro product that is out there that some parents don't know about. Um, so the little um, sacks basically that um, you're able to wrap your baby in. Um, so you can start off on that uh, baby with the blue where they are wrapped in it and they're swallowed, swallowed into it. And then um, you wanna be transitioning them out of it though around two months. 
so any signs of rolling, you want to start transitioning them out of a swaddle. So that's something parents don't know about either. So, um, so the baby in the middle right there, you can transition to their hands being out. So that's the um, safe, uh, safe step um, around two months. And then you fully can transition out into a sack. For me, I think it's, um, it was easier for me just to go straight from the, the swaddle just to onesie because it's just, you know, get right there because you're going to eventually have to be there anyways. But it might be a quick transition for some babies. So using that middle step, hands are free, that's very uh, safe, but they're still wrapped around their waist so they feel, still feel secure and then you eventually get to the um, point where they're um, not wrapped anymore and they're in the sack and then eventually from there you get them into the onesie. And I, I really liked the sleep sacks even you know past the swaddle because um, little kids roll all around the bed. So even as my son, I just kept trying to get the biggest size that I could get so that um, he would sleep in it still because he just rolled all around. So even if he was old enough for a blanket, it wouldn't have ended up on him. Um, and then he was old enough that he could even walk in it, which I don't <laughs> recommend because they could fall and hit themselves <laughs> in the face, but um, that didn't happen. But it was a great photo, but I would not recommend that. But um, they're really useful actually. And sometimes you just have to survive too, you know? So like for, for me, I um, I went straight, just straight to a onesie and it was a little rough, but I've definitely heard of people using the, the sacks for longer. Cause yeah, they roll around a lot, they wake themselves up and you just need some sleep sometimes. Okay, so um, they'll be spending, hopefully your newborn will spend a lot of time sleeping. Um, you won't, but they will. Um, and <laughs> they'll spend a lot of time feeding. So feeding over the first year of life changes a lot. And basically though, for zero to 12 months, your baby is going to be taking breast milk or formula. Um, now when we talk about other foods, so when your baby's at least four months old, they can start purees and eventually they'll take sippy cups with water and eventually they'll take finger foods. Um, but all of that is a whole separate conversation. So we're going to focus on all of the <laughs> accessories that you never knew you would ever need or want um, for feeding your baby both breast milk and formula. So what I like to tell people is that bre breastfeeding is a great goal. I, it's wonderful. Um, what I would say is that it is it, for most people, it's difficult at the beginning. So I guess the best comparison I have is that breastfeeding is kind of like riding a bike, but I don't know if you remember when you were eight years old and first learned how to ride a bike without training wheels and it felt very awkward and you didn't know what you were doing and you didn't understand how anyone else could ride a bike. But then once you got the hang of it, it was super easy. So I think that Breastfeeding is a lot like that, and at the beginning, it's very awkward, and if you go in expecting that, then you won't be so frustrated. Um, I do think that having some preparation is helpful. So there are books out there. Um, Hogue has excellent breastfeeding classes ahead of time, and um, I think those are a great investment. So the everyday supplies for breastfeeding. So first of all, you can see on your left, um, there's two pictures uh, for the nursing pillow. So there are different types of nursing pillows. Do you have to have an exact nursing pillow? Can you use regular pillows? Yes. Nursing pillows are nice because they're the exact correct shape that you need um, and they're firm. So like you wouldn't want to use a bed pillow um, because the baby sinks into it. Because really the reason why you're using a nursing pillow is because if you don't, you will be leaning over all the time to breastfeed your baby and it hurts your back. So the breastfeeding pillow props the baby up so that you can sit more comfortably. That's all they're for. You don't have to have one, but again, it does make things easier. Now, which one you like, that's personal preference. It really doesn't matter. Um, it's just for comfort, really. And you can also become hands-free if you get the hang of it. <laughs> Yes, so you can get the hang of it and the baby's propped up and then you can go like this and text <laughs> so, so that you're holding the baby and texting at the same time. Yeah, because you get a lot of reading done when you've got a newborn. I mean, just, just novels All and novels. <laughs> um, sending portal messages to your doctor. Okay, so the other thing is 
basic a nursing cover, especially when you're new to breastfeeding because it's just very awkward. You use nursing covers both when you're nursing your child, you use them, we're gonna talk about breast pumps, you may use it with that. Um, certainly you would use it when you're out. You may even use it at your own home if you have visitors. Um, so that you don't have to be like banished to the other room mm -hmm. when company comes, unless you want to be, and then don't get a nursing cover. Um, and then uh, nursing pads. So one of the very, very glamorous things about breastfeeding is that your breasts leak. Yeah, that's right, mm -hmm. you're gonna leak milk. Um, and so <laughs> breast or nursing pads, are, you just put in your bra so that you don't leak on your bra or through your shirt. So um, those are necessary. Now, you can get disposable ones. You can have ones that you wash. I'm sure Mother Nature would love it if you get the ones you wash. I have to admit, I got the ones I could throw away because I just wanted it, everything to be as easy as possible. Um, but too. those are things that you, you, you definitely need those. You're washing a lot of things. You're washing a lot <laughs> of things. If you get the ones that you wash, that's fine, but then get a bunch of them because you're not gonna be wanting to wash them every day. No. So the glamour continues. So um, I wouldn't buy, so, so there's something called a nipple shield. Now I wouldn't buy this ahead of time because you may not need this. And also um, as your body gets larger, so do your breasts and your nipple shield size will change and is specific to you. So some babies have trouble latching or you might have pain. So sometimes a nipple shield is helpful. You can see in that picture, it just goes over your nipple and then it has holes in it so the baby can feed. Um, I just, we put this in here just so you know it's, a, it's an option and that it's out there. So if you're having trouble later, um, you can order one or, or send someone to pick one up for you. Now what you will absolutely need is nipple cream. Um, so, which is typically lanolin. So it's kind of like the consistency of Vaseline, but it's more healing than that. And so, again, with the glamour of breastfeeding at the beginning, um, you're, you're going to have some nipple pain and irritated skin, and this is everything. Um, and you will be applying it all the time. Um, you do not have to remove it to breastfeed. So just, just trust us and just get this, please. Get <laughs> yes. this, just get it. Um, and then sometimes people will buy uh, gel pads. Um, they'll either be warm or cold if you're having um, breast tenderness. Um, I don't think you have to necessarily buy these ahead of time, but um, the, if you make the gels warm and you put them up against your breast, it, will, it may help with the letdown of the milk before you start nursing. If you're having uh, breast pain, um, then you may have a clogged duct. And so then you probably would use some, you might use some cooling, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Okay, and then for uh, breast pumps, there's a lot of breast pumps out there, but the main ones that we would always recommend would be the double electric breast pumps. Those are the, um, easiest and they work the best and there's a lot of them out there um, but I bet you'll find that a lot of people have their opinions on the best ones and the ones that work the um, work the most efficiently um, so but for sure double electric breast pump I always recommend a portable one a one that's rechargeable you don't want to always be um, attached to a wall um, because you'll be surprised as to where you're going to use these um, a car maybe, you know, it can happen. So um, you want that option. And so it's always important to have the portable ones, the ones that you can bring around with you. And then there are also wearable ones that um, are very expensive and typically I don't recommend them. They, uh, the wearable meaning that you can have them basically in your bra and your shirt over them and then no one will really know and you can just walk around. And they're kind of marketed as, oh hey, you can, you can clean, you can cook, you can shop, um, you can work. Um, <laughs> Um, and <clears throat> give yourself a break too, you know, um, you're going through a lot, there's a lot going on and sometimes pumping, and for me, I don't know for you, but it was nice like to have a little bit, little bit of a break where you sit down for like the 15, 20 minutes, um, give yourself that time and you can catch up on work if you want to, you can. Or, and this is the day and age of the smartphone. So you phone. can check emails, you can check yep. YouTube, like there's, Just you can enjoy. call friends, right? Relax like a little bit. I used to, 
I had one job where I would pump at work and I always used to call one of my friends and she you could hear the pump and she'd mm -hmm. be like, you're pumping right oh, now, yeah. aren't you? I'm like, yeah, of course I oh, am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that at, as a rule, we should just, I personally, so the wearable, the wear, oops, sorry, the wearable pumps were not invented when I had my children um, 10 years ago. And so it really is the concept that you put these things in your bra and then you just walk around and do your daily activities. And I think that we should all decide as women that this is way too much. <laughs> um, a man would never do that. So if you can't take 10 to 15 minutes to stop to pump, then maybe breastfeeding is not going to work out for you and you should move on. I mean, realistically, that's just too much to, I think it is just too much to expect from yourself. And when you're a when you're when you're a new parent or any actually well when you're not a new parent you already know this but when you're a new parent the most impo important thing is to be flexible and to be able to change your expectations right and so you know if you can't take a break to pump then i don't know if pumping's going to work for you in general and they're just also really expensive and they don't really work very well too so that's right. the thing out the other part about it is that they don't seem to um, produce a, as much milk as the other forms do um, so over time you might just get frustrated as it is and you spent all this money and then the other part is that insurance can cover a lot of these breast pumps so you go through your insurance you call your insurance company you go on your website you talk to your OB and they'll give you the information and you can usually get usually whatever pump you want covered, but definitely not the wearable ones. Those are not covered. So that's another uh, caveat to all of this. Um, but typically it'll cover either all of your breast pump or um, or partials if you want like more of the fancy version. Um, and then a huge thing to talk about that I was like, we have to talk about <laughs> breast pump bras because I didn't know about them um, with my first uh, baby. And I, as I was pumping one day, I'm sitting there and I was like, there has to be a better way. Like there has to be as like milk's kind of spraying out and I'm just sitting there. And then of course there was a better better way. No one told me about this. So I have to tell everyone about this now. It's, it's a bra that you basically attach to yourself obviously. And you just um, put your, um, the, the breast, um, pump supplies attached there um the i don't know why i'm blanking out like just the, the, the catch the bottle or yeah um, I, I had the same situation that with my first baby i didn't know about this and then the second one i was like this is amazing it's everything so i mean it's all of these things take a lot of logistics still so yeah. basically if you were doing this at work <laughs> We'll just go through the details if you're doing it this at work you're probably wearing a nursing bra and then that flips down opens up to yep. expose your mm -hmm. bosom and then you take this and it goes around almost like a tube top and you zip it up and then it has holes in it and then the holes because it's like spandex it holds in the pump and so you truly are hands free so that you can use your smartphone yeah or else you're just sitting there like this and right <laughs> right you know then you're really just stuck yeah that and it's, it's a little miserable so maybe speaker so, i mean some people do it but yeah maybe but, you can use speaker you know yeah that, you can but, use speaker phone yeah. but yeah this is key <laughs> right okay and these i love these so breast milk collectors i didn't quite get the hang of these with my uh first i wish i would have because once i had my second i started getting the hang of it they were magic um so these are ways to collect your milk without actually using the pump so pumps are great um but there's a lot of parts to them there's a lot of cleaning um there's a lot going on um, with with these collectors so they're basically these little um, like one piece devices that use a suction that you can use for um, capturing your milk um, when you feel a little bit engorged you can use it like that you can use it for um, capturing your milk that's leaking so the beauty of breastfeeding <laughs> your milk is gonna leak out while you're feeding your baby on one side, typically, not always, <laughs> but you're, so you're feeding baby on one side and now you're leaking on the other and you, you're losing all this beautiful milk and it's sad and it's messy. Um, so these are great because you can just put um, that device on your breast and it's collecting that milk. You're not necessarily sucking it off all the time because you don't wanna lose all that loose. You don't wanna be taking that milk off before the next breast, but you're collecting that milk, that valuable milk that you can store. Um, so then you can kind of, just place it in that area, collect that milk that's spilling, and then transfer your baby to the other side, and then transfer that uh, collector 
to the side that was just um, breastfed on, and then you can pull off the rest of the milk by just suctioning it on. Super easy, you just, you literally just squeeze it, suck it, suck it onto your breast, and then it attaches, and then your baby goes on the next side. Um, and then little by little, you're collecting milk that way without having to, to clean that much. It's just one, one item to clean, and it's um, very light, very small. You can bring it um, with you in your bag, and so it's very portable. Um, and then other ways that parents use this or moms use this is if your baby only prefers one side, um, you don't want to get too engorged on the other, so you can collect and suction off the, um, the milk on the other side before the next feed so that, um, again, you're not too engorged um, prior to that feed. And you're not completely emptying your breast either using this, so it's not electric um, like a pump is. So it's really awesome, really convenient. I actually didn't use a pump until I went back to work with my second one. I just used this and I collected a ton of milk and it was really nice. Have two or three, if not. Yeah, <laughs> really great. And they're inexpensive. Okay. Okay, so bottles. Um, basically what I would just say here is for the most part, there's two sizes of bottles. There's small and there's big. And it's usually around four ounces or around eight ounces. For the first couple months, you're, you don't need anything bigger than a four ounce bottle. Now. I know that the bottle manufacturing companies want you to buy kits that have like eight different sizes and stuff like that. And that's fine. Um, I just would say that there are some babies who are particular about bottles, not all of them, but some. So if you have a baby who ends up being kind of particular about a bottle and you bought the whole kit of like eight set of eight, then you're just tossing the rest. So I would just get a few four ounce ones at the beginning. Um, and then see what your needs are. So the other thing is that um, there's a lot of options, right? Like straight or hourglass or bent or lined or round. I don't know why you need a round one. I, I don't even understand that. Um, but all of these things, they're marketing, right? These are, if there was a magical bottle that prevented babies from having gas, we, all the bottles would mimic that. So there is none, despite the fact that some of these bottles um, advertise that they're, they're going to have less gas or less spit up or something. It doesn't make any sense. So um, basically, you can get the bottles that fit into your diaper bag. Now, the bottle nipples, sometimes some babies are great. They will say, I will take any bottle, I will feed from a breast, I will feed from a bottle, I don't, it can be breast milk, it can be formula, I don't care, just feed me. Um, I had those actually. They were terrible, <laughs> terrible sleepers though. So they, they, they definitely got me back. Um, my first son and I spent a lot of time crying at night. So, um, but, <laughs> but there, are, there are some babies who are particular about the nipple. They're divas, what can I say? So what I would say is either just buy one type from the beginning and see how it goes and see if which baby you have, or maybe you decide to get two types in case you have a diva and you wanna be prepared, that's fine too, but don't overthink this. Like, I don't understand this. I mean, in this picture, there's the top one is a Dr. Brown's nipple. So there's actually, there's actually some science to the fact that some babies this actually helps them feed if they're if they have trouble with drinking from a bottle but also please keep in mind that drinking from a bottle is excessively easy babies can do it so most babies don't need this um but then there'll be bottles that say it's more like a breast i breasts come on all different shapes and sizes so i don't understand who they use for the mold but um it doesn't make much of a difference um i personally went for the least expensive bottles and then went from there okay. and that's what I stuck with. Basic so, model, work your way up as needed. Yeah, good. yeah. Um, now the other thing is that d regardless of which uh, nipple type, bottle type you purchase, there will be different, there'll also be different flows. So there'll be zero, one, two, et cetera. And basically what happens is that when you go, f when you increase the number, it changes either how many holes are in the nipple or how wide they are. Basically, um, the zero one is the slowest flow, and then it goes up from there. But the companies on their packaging will tell, they will give you age recommendations. I would say start with zero and don't change unless your baby 
seems frustrated, okay? So my children, um, even as they got older, they were, when they would have, they would have a bottle sometimes in the morning and they were kind of like the adult who says like, don't bother me till my, till I'm done drinking my coffee in the morning. Like they enjoyed to like sit and savor their bottle. So they were using, they only stayed with a slow flow nipple and we never went up from there. Yeah, mine we went to a one. My daughter has like a two every once in a while, but I, we definitely did not go by the ages. I feel like that's just more of a money grab yeah. and um, it's not needed usually. Yeah, just start with the so zero with and then app, see what if you, happens. Yeah, if you and need to buy 10 months. So, yeah. yeah, if you need to buy more, you can, but yeah. you probably won't. Oh, sorry, that's a duplicate. Okay, pacifiers. So we love pacifiers as pediatricians, um, most and moms. moms. Yeah, moms. Yeah, yeah. yeah mainly. <laughs> um, they are um, safe. They are sits protective, um, and they're great for soothing. Um, the thing is, you do want to make sure that you um, wait for about a week or so to um, use them. Talk to your pediatrician first because you want to make sure the pa the um, feeding's going r good. There's not too much weight loss because. Um, Typically in the beginning, when your baby's crying, they need food, so you don't want to, you, you know, put something else in the in the way of them um, eating. Um, but after that, after that week process or one to two weeks, when you have really good breastfeeding established, there won't also be that nipple confusion possibility. Um, then you can use these for a soothing technique um, tool. Um, and again, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of different ones, very expensive ones. Generally, just start with the most basic and see what your baby likes. You can start with two. Also, a lot of these will be sent to you. There's a lot of of like samples sent to you in the mail that you'll just have them at home. Um, so you can start off with that free one that you got or that one you got from a friend for your baby shower and just see if that works and then um, go from there. Uh, you don't need to go crazy in the beginning because again, um, typically babies just take any of them really at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So in terms of cleaning, um, so typically you only need to sterilize once. So everything, your bottle, your pacifier, your breast, mu your breast pump supplies. Um, so don't worry about overdoing this, but you can as um, more often if you want to, but it's not absolutely necessary. So you can buy sterilizing um, uh, or sterilizers like that um, top picture right there. Um, it takes up some space on the countertop, but obviously it's kind of nice to just put everything in there and then be able to do um, the rest of the cleaning that you're doing. Um, the picture right below that is important to know that you should not put any of your cleaning um, straight into the sink. So you don't want to uh, risk contamination by putting any of your bottles or pacifiers straight into the sink. So that Cause is- Because your kitchen sink's disgusting. Dirty, yeah. yeah. So you do not want that to be, um, you do not want to clean that way. So in order to clean, you want you use uh, soap and water, hot so or hot water and soap, and you want to use either a big um, bucket or bowl or a basin that's only for that. So you're only using it for your bo your baby stuff. Um, so you have your own separate brush to oh, separate brush, separate uh, bowl or basin, and you oh, put that in the sink. Yeah, do not use do not use your kitchen sponge no for your baby separate that's everything that's, yeah that's again disgusting dirty too. Yeah. yeah so dirty. <laughs> separate things <laughs> for your baby um so you can also sterilize by boiling um for five minutes um and, and you can put bottles and um your supplies directly into the um, dishwasher if you want to but make sure you avoid the bottom shelf because you uh, can risk melting your items there so you can put on the top shelf okay okay so infant formula um Obviously, breastfeeding is fantastic. Um, it's a great bonding experience when it works out. Um, and in no way do we want to detract from that. But formula is a tool that many people need to use in addition. And sometimes we go so far in supporting breast milk that we completely, we don't give any education about formula and then parents are really confused. Um, so here's just the bottom line. There are for the most part, there's three major formula companies in the United States. There's Infamil, Similac, and Gerber, okay? Oh, let me go back for a second. So um, each one has a entire line of formula products, okay? So I know this is not the best comparison because I'm comparing it to soda, but if you imagine that Infamil and Similac are Coke and Pepsi, and there's they Coke and Pepsi have like a bunch of different options and then Gerber's kind of like Dr. Pepper. They have less options, but still great. <laughs> um, 
So the bottom line, though, is that, um, and, and it's very overwhelming, because if you go to the store, they have all of the options. <laughs> so it's like a whole wall of options. Um, but the bottom line is that for these three companies, every formula, every formula company has First, they have their standard for formulation, which frankly, of all their options, typically their, their basic model, I guess you could say, um, typically is the one most similar, most similar to breast milk, to tell you the truth. Um, and then they'll have a host of special formulas, meaning they'll say that they're gentle or that it's for comfort or sensitive or lactose free or this is for spit up. Basically, they're saying that your baby's problems with spit up and gas are going to be cured by their formula. Now, largely that's probably not going to be true. Um, before bouncing around with a lot of formulas, it doesn't harm your baby to try different formulas. It's fine. But if you do change around a lot, you're really probably wasting your money um, because I would ask your pediatrician if they think that there's a different formula that would work better for you, because otherwise, most people change to formulas that they don't have a benefit. Like the baby isn't less fussy, the baby just got a little older, and actually that formula is much less like breast milk than what they started with. So in this picture, these exact pictures are pretty much the standard for each of these companies. Um, now, European formula is gets a lot of information. They are all over the internet. Um, there are clearly um, moms who are getting paid very well to be like formula influencers. That's the best. That, that's all I can imagine. So, but the, the the question is like like seriously, what's the deal? What is the deal? Um, so, so the bottom line is that European formulas and U.S. formulas are largely similar. The, nutritionally, they're very similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're very similar. Now, there is a major difference, which is that in the United States, we think that there should be much more iron in formula, and in the European Union, they think there should be much less. So the FDA says that, um, so, so all of the Europe, most of the European formulas, if not all of them, would never be able to be FDA approved because they don't have enough iron in them. So that is something that if you choose to use European formula anyway, that is something that you should think about um, and, um, and talk to your doctor about. The other thing is that European formulas are all organic. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, the bottom line is that no European formulas are FDA approved. So what does that mean? It means that the formulas are made in the European Union, fine. They're approved by their version of the FDA, fine. And then third-party distributors buy their formula, not the formula company, third-party distributors buy their formula in Europe, ship it or fly it to the United States illegally, and then sell it illegally in the United States. So what that means is nobody's watching. <laughs> um, and if typically a formula would, every step of the process would be regulated. And in this way, the entire, all of the transport and storage between the EU and here is not regulated. And I personally don't have a lot of faith that companies do the right thing when no one's watching. So I'm not a big fan of this and it becomes much more expensive as well. And I can pretty much guarantee your, your pediatrician is not gonna be on board with these. Now, what I can tell you is that US does have organic, the US does have organic options. There's Bobby, Burt's Bees, Earth's Best, Infamil has an organic one. Happy Baby and um, Similec does as well. Now, if you are really, really enthusiastic about the European formulas, then we actually do have um, almost identical um, options in the United States now. So there's a formula called Bobby, which is not in stores at this point, you buy uh, online, um, that is extremely similar. And also Infamil has a new organic formula called Simply Organic, that one is also very, very similar. <clears throat> so I would recommend those, and then you can also save money. So that is it for today. Um, do we have time for questions or oh, no? Yes, we, did we go? Okay. And, and uh, one thing I do want to just say is that um, because we know we only scratch the surface, um, 
we will be having a part two in February where we're going to talk about baby gear, car seats, baby carriers, um, skin care, different health and safety items. So we do have one question so far. I think that if there's more questions coming in, I think we do have time for questions. So um, this question is, are swings safe for babies' hips, et cetera? Is it safe for them to fall asleep in if you watch them? Um, so I definitely have an answer for that if you want me to Why start. Just okay, go. I love swings. Um, so, so they're not safe for sleeping, um, but they are great for soothing. Um, again, they grow out of them, so you have to make sure, first off, you have to make sure that your baby is big enough to be in them. Um, and just like anything though, you don't want to leave them in there for too long because yes, there's um, certain things, that, I mean, you want to bring them out to, to have, have them on the floor, have them stretch out, do some wiggling time. Um, hips though, it should be fine for an hour or so if they're in there, um, but again, you're, you're watching them. This is not a safe place for them to sleep and um, they're very useful, And um, but they do grow a lot of them pretty quickly. I think else? they're... I think if your baby is soothed by a, sl a swing, it is fantastic and you should do it. Just watch them. They can sleep just in there, but just watch them. Yeah, that's all. Oh yeah. We used to have um, like stations in our house, called stations, when our baby was a little bit on the fussier side, around uh, two months or so, and we would have, okay, we use a swing for about 30 minutes. We'll use the, um, he used to love his uh, changing table for about 30 minutes. We did a little like, you know, bounce it around, shushing, walk around the room about 30 minutes. We had a little incline that you, of course, are there. They're playing. So you kind of have to do your thing and just work with them and do what you have to do. My <laughs> first son, who I love dearly, um, was an extremely fussy baby. And so with a swing, we had a swing and I tried to put him in there and I was like, what are these for? He doesn't like this. Um, and then I had my second son who I do not love more. I love the same, but he would go on the swing and be happy. And I was like, these are magical. Oh. This is what these are for. Yeah. So and I think they're great. I was also say, give it um, but I a wouldn't, few minutes but, too. To but like but don't like to... get the most expensive model because no. they're only going to be in it for a few months. So yeah. it yeah. just needs to swing. Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be that complicated. And all these products that you're using for soothing too, don't give up on it in like 30 seconds. And know I don't, that it takes a few minutes to like know if they're really going to settle. And I have no idea why it needs to hook up to your smartphone, but nipple guards. Colloidals, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm gonna be honest. Okay, so this says thoughts on colloidal silver and nipple guard, colloid, I don't know what that is. Um, I'm just gonna be honest with you, I'm sorry. You would think that we would know all the little things out there. So what we'll do is, we will, we will look at this save this, <laughs> yeah, we will look and up. we'll add that on to the next one. No idea what that is. I'm sorry. Okay. Sounds uncomfortable, but okay. Um, the ha thoughts on the Hatch Baby Smart Scale Baby Changer. I don't know why you need to uh, weigh your baby at home. So yeah, I think it causes a lot of anxiety to, yes. to weigh them at home. Um, so I don't think it's necessary. Um, you're gonna be stressed out weighing them all the time. So when you come into your pediatrician's office, you're in, in the beginning, it's at the second or, th or sorry, no, it's the third or fourth day of life, and then it's about two weeks, and then two months, four months, six months. And those are ideal time frames and uh, milestones that you're looking for for weight gain. Um, so any more than that, you see variations that are going to stress you out. So I don't think that you need necessarily need something like this. And most babies, like in an ideal world, the way that mother and mother nature intended feeding to go is that the baby's in charge. So the baby wakes up and yells at you, and that's how you know that they're hungry and they need to be fed. And unless you have an, un I mean, some babies are just too sleepy for that, and then you need your pediatrician to help you figure out the right feeding schedule. But typically, if you just um, feed the baby when the baby tells you, then you have no problems. And I certainly would never get a baby scale. Yeah, no. Like, put if you're going to spend money on that, put it into the swing or something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is, is there a particular temperature and hum humidity for ideal sleep? So for safe sleep, you want it to be on the cooler side, so 69 to 72 in that range. Um, so that's for safe sleeping. You want to over, overheat your baby. Um, I know it's harder if you live, um, for me in my area, Huntington Beach, a lot of us don't have... Um, ACs or heaters, um, so you just need to be, um, you just need to get a fan or um, try to at least make your, your area um, a little bit on the cooler side, that's uh, for safety. And then humidity, I don't know if there's an ideal like studied 
Yeah. So so some uh, monitors will have humidity on it, they'll have temperature on it, they'll have everything on it, and it's not. I would turn that off. <laughs> I don't. Again, I don't stressful. have. I don't have any idea why you would need to know the humidity yeah. and how you would change it. Yeah. I if mean, it wasn't correct. Yeah, I guess you can. Use I don't a, know. A, a humidifier. Like if. What do they do in Florida? <laughs> is it too humid? Humid? Do those? I mean, yeah, yeah. So I would turn that off. Yeah, turn that feature are, off. You don't need that. Yeah, turn that feature off. Sometimes less is more. And then, is. in general, new, if you have a full-term baby who's a normal size baby, meaning your doctor didn't tell you you have a preemie, and your doctor didn't tell you you have a really, you know, underweight baby, most newborns need about one more layer than you do mm -hmm. when you're sleeping, yeah. right? So you can. That's where the sleep sacks are helpful too. You know, like. If your house is a little cooler, you might use the fleece one. And if it's not cooler, you would use the cotton ones. So this is a nice uh, question to transition into because it's talking about monitors. So um, for baby monitors, I think also less is more. Um, I'm sure you agree too. Um, Yes, there are the ones, the video ones, and we were talking about that prior to this presentation. I like the video ones because I can check in and see what they're doing. They connect to your phone, um, but but there are some that are so expensive, like two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars for all this like monitoring of temperature, of humidity, um, heart rate, like you know the, the outlet things like that. Um, not needed. which have been recalled, recalled, yeah, recalled. So not needed. Um, and anxiety provoking specifically <laughs> the FDA has recalled them and said do not use them yeah because they're not accurate enough they don't catch any yes. any worrisome time and then also <coughs> um, so I actually just got it's just like basically a, a typical camera that um, connects to my phone and I use that and it was $25 um, so that's that's what I got for my babies and I put them wherever they're sleeping and we will discuss that more at Oh, yeah, we'll Part go through. Two. Yeah, and there's you another gotta, question on that. You got to keep them wanting more. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just give a little. How <laughs> often can I play with baby, or should I let them sleep in bassinet? Yes, you should let them sleep as much as they want. Bassinet to crib timeline. Timeline. So when your baby's awake, so in the beginning, your baby's gonna be sleeping a lot, like 17 hours, 16 hours a day. Unfortunately, but not in, in a row. Small role, bits. Yeah. Yes small bits so two hours three hours maybe four if you're lucky um yeah. when they're awake then yeah you want to play with them you want to interact with them sing to them talk to them again a new a newborn and even for the first couple months like you're not in charge of these babies they're in charge of you <laughs> i mean good luck trying to be in charge of them because they come out and they're like oh my god that's so cute mom and dad still think they're in charge um when the baby wants to sleep the baby sleeps and when the baby wants to be awake even if you want them to sleep they're going to be awake, even if it's two in the morning and they're just staring at you and you're like, mm -hmm. and like, you think, you please, please <laughs> go to sleep. Yeah. I will sell my soul if you go to sleep. They won't. So um, I would say at night, let when them they're be in charge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would just say like you're, you, you, especially the first couple of months, don't, don't overthink this and let them do what they're going to do. Yeah. When they're awake at night, let let it be dark and you know, quiet and don't right. play with them then. Yeah, so I think we're out of time though. So we just yeah. got the signals so I got a little, <laughs> um, yeah, anyways. Um, but thank you so much for um, joining us. This was so much fun. And again, I'm uh, Dr. Kimberly Lank and um, my colleague. And I'm Dr. Julie Palmisano. And, we'll and see you next time. we will see you in February. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. I know you. that you're very excited. And we'll look up that question that we didn't know. Oh yes. We'll have that answer. <laughs> we will. <laughs> okay, thank you. Take care.